you guys. Welcome back. Uh, today we're going to go over diffraction and interference of light. Now, a uh, major theme through the electromagnetic radiation unit is um, looking at how light behaves so we can create a model to picture it. How does it behave? Does it behave like a wave or does it behave like a particle? Um, and the answer is it's not or, it's actually and. Uh, light has a dual nature. There are some things that light does that can only be explained if you imagine it as a wave, model it as a wave, and not as a particle. And then there, are, that's chapter 13 basically, and then chapter 14 we're going to get into the, the particle nature of light, the ways in which light behaves only as a particle and not as a wave. So it's a really kind of trippy thing to get your head around because there's nothing like that that we see in everyday life. Like when we see, when you when I picture, when I say the word wave, you probably picture something like on the screen, like a water wave or something like that. A particle, um, when I say particle, you mean you probably picture like a ball or something like that. How can, how can those two things be the same? How can light be the, both? And it just is. Um, it, it's so that's the that's one of the trickier parts about EMR. So anyway, today is a uniquely wave property that we're going to go over: diffraction and interference. So this is introduced in Physics 20 when a wave passes through a small opening. There's two of them there, just like that. It will diffract. It is the spreading out or bending of waves that it passes around a barrier or in a small opening. So in order for diffraction to occur, the size of the obstacle opening must be small when compared to the wavelength. And there's a few videos that I've uh, linked up in the uh, Google Classroom there that will demonstrate this better than me moving a mouse around on a static picture there. Okay, so basically what we have here is these two slits act as point sources of waves. So it's kind of like the, the waves spread out in a circular pattern in the same way if you dipped your finger up and down in a pond, the waves would spread out in a circular pattern. So if you've got two point sources of waves beyond the openings here, we've got regions where a crest meets a crest or a trough meets a trough. That's constructive interference. And there's also locations where a crest and a trough cancel each other out. And that would be destructive interference. So if we can get light to do that, um, that for sure will will um, illustrate its its wave nature. In other words, a time in which it behaves like a wave. So the guy to do that to demonstrate that was Thomas Young, Young's experiment. Okay, so diffraction interference of light results in an interference pattern that was projected onto a screen. So we can't obviously see light waves, you know, going from just like we could see water waves, but we can see light when it hits something. We can project it onto a screen. So what you're gonna get is you're, where two light waves arrive at a point in the screen and they, they arrive and you have constructive interference where a crest meets a crest or a trough meets a trough, you're gonna get a bright spot. And that's called an antinode or an antinodal line. And where a crest and a trough cancel each other out, you're gonna get a dark spot and that's called a nodal line. So this is basically what it would look like we, we do this experiment. If we were in the classroom, we would definitely do this. This is a very good one. Where you got a laser pointer, you shine it through what is called a diffraction grating. We'll get into that in a few minutes, what that is, but basically two slits. Um, and what you have is this. You don't actually see this. What you actually see is um, regions of constructive and destructive interference. I got a picture coming up of what you actually see when you're in the lab. But um, notice you've got the where they've got um, the laser light shining out here and here and here and here. Um, these correspond to bright spots. The regions in between would be dark spots. So we have antinodes and nodes. Constructive interference would be an antinode. Uh, destructive interference would be a node. So this is what it actually would look like in the lab. We generally do this in the dark. You guys would shine your laser on a uh, sheet of paper on the on the wall and you would actually 
put lines with your pencil to measure the distance between the bright spots. So here we've got what's called the central bright antinode right here. And on either side is what we call the first order node. So there and there. And then adjacent to those, we've got the second order. And then the third order there and there. So the nodes are the bright spots and the regions in between here are the antinodes. Okay, so this picture from your textbook, that central bright antinode, a wave from source one or slit one, and a wave from slit two, if you take a look at a point in the middle, that point on the, that's in the middle on the screen there is the same distance away from source one and source two. So the same number of waves fit into the path from this slit to the screen as this slit to the screen. So you're gonna get constructive interference. Where you've got, and this is where the picture from this, obviously this picture from your textbook, this is what, what my lines originally were here, right here. This is at your first order um, antinode or bright fringe right here on the previous slide. Whoops, Ugh. would be, come on. Here, so here's the central bright antinode and there's the one that I've sort of lined up on the, on the diagram on the next slide here, right here. So for this one, at any antinode, doesn't matter where it is, whether it's here, first order, second order, third, fourth, first, second, third, fourth, symmetrical on either side, the waves from each source arrive at that point on the screen in phase. So let's say the, dis the number of wavelengths from source two to the screen is let's say, I don't know, 20 or something like that, doesn't matter. The number of waves from here to there would also be not 20 because it's not the same uh, distance, but it might be 21 waves fit in. But if a whole number of wavelengths fits into that each path, they're still going to arrive at that point in phase. Whereas at the first node, so let's say right here, for example, you get destructive interference, where let's say the distance from there to there is, I don't know, 22 wavelengths, and the distance from here to here would be 21 and a half wavelengths. So a half wavelength um, path difference would result in destructive interference. Okay, so there's some math here. Uh, the interference that Young observed can be used to determine the wavelength of the light used. Now we have decided to skip the derivation of these. We're gonna, I'm gonna show you two formulas. I'm gonna skip the derivation of them because it's, if we're in class, we might go over it, but since we're not, we're not. It's basically, I'm going to, here's the formula, uh, here's what the variables mean, and go do some word problems with this formula. It's going to be very straightforward. So, this experiment actually allows you to, to calculate the wavelength of the light used. So, remember when we went over the electromagnetic spectrum, from red to violet, Roy G. Biv is the visible portion of the spectrum. We know that range of wavelengths. It's, um, 400 nanometers to 700 or 450 to 400 to 750 nanometers. So 400 being violet, um, 750 being red. So, all right, there's the wavelength. D, distance between the slits from there to there. Don't worry about these triangles and stuff like that. It's, it's to, used to derive a formula, but we're not gonna go over the derivation. Theta is the angle of deviation. So as you, Go up if you go to the central bright um, antinode right here at the top. As you move out f between from the first order to the second order to the third order, as you go from you know from the center at, at a different angle like that, that is that angle that you're talking about, that angle of deviation from the central bright fringe. The order of the fringe, something I mentioned before. The one that is adjacent to the central bright antinode, the closest is the first order, and then second, then third, then fourth, and fifth. And then the nodes correspond to the dark spots, correspond to values of n of 0.5.
So 0.5, 1.5, 2.5, etc. So this would be the first order minimum, second order minimum, third order minimum. Light with a wavelength of 570 nanometers is incident on two slits that are 0 0.400 millimeters apart. Determine the angle of the fraction of the second antinodal line. So, okay, antinodal line, here we're talking about the bright fringes. So, they correspond to values of n that are whole numbers. So, if we're talking about the second antinodal line, we're talking about n equals 2. So, it's a very straightforward question here. Um, we go over a formula, n lambda equals d sine theta. Solve for sine theta, n lambda over d. And to solve for the angle inverse sine, n again is 2 lambda 570 nanometers would be 5.70 times 10 to the negative 7 meters because nano means times 10 to the negative 9. And um, <clears throat> we've got 4 .0 .40 millimeters, millimeters apart, so 4.0 times 10 to the negative 4 meters apart. And we end up getting a very small angle of diffraction, 0 0.16 degrees. So this would be a difficult thing to measure, obviously. So that's why we have that small angle approximation to help us uh, use the terminal wavelength of light under experimental conditions where we're measuring things. That one's next. Okay. So I'm going to skip over a lot of the stuff that's on this slide, but quite often when you guys are in the lab, um, you can't, obviously you don't, all you see is some dots on the, on the wall. You don't see these lines. You can't take a, a protractor and measure that angle. So what you do is you have to measure some other things to basically determine that angle. And here is a, a there's another formula for doing that. And it is gone the next page, but basically ignore this. So the only reason I, th I thought about taking it out because this is my notes that I would use in class, but I thought I would leave it here to just point at it and say, don't worry about this in the same way if that you're reading the textbook and you're wondering, okay, what part did we skip over and what part is important? This part isn't. Okay, so to define some terms here, there's the next formula, wavelength of light, D, distance between slits, that does not change. Um, X, now X is the distance between the central antinode and the nth antinodal line. So if it's the first maximum, it's n equals 1. If it's the second, second maximum, then it's n equals 2. And if it's the third bright fringe or maximum, it's n equals 3, etc. So the order of the fringe. Uh, L is the distance between the diffraction grating and the screen. So that's easily measured, right? So basically, if we go back to this experimental setup here, this it says it right here is capital D, but this is L, the distance between the grating and the screen. Okay, and... Um, X, again, is the distance that you would measure on that paper, distance between the central antinode and uh, whatever antinode you're talking about. So this formula is known as the small angle approximation. In other words, you use it only when the angle of deviation is less than 10 degrees. So I'm going to go over an example um, on the next slide, basically, to to show to illustrate when you can use this formula and when you may not use this formula. An unknown wavelength of light is incident on a diffraction grating that is ruled with 200 lines per millimeter. 
the distance between the central bright antinode and the third bright fringe is 28.5 centimeters when the screen is 75.0 centimeters from the grating. Determine the wavelength of the light. Okay, so here we go. We've got our screen here, and our slits are down here. So here's our slits. Draw that a little bit better. Like that. The central bright antinode is here. This would be our value of x. 28.5 centimeters, and the distance between the slits and the screen, L, is 75.0 centimeters. So essentially what a lot of us would do is like, oh, we're given Ds and Xs and Ls and stuff like that. Uh, we obviously have to use this formula. But remember, only if the angle of deviation is less than 10 degrees. So it's only valid if your angle is less than 10 degrees. So what we're going to do is we're going to find out if it is valid. So what we do is we draw ourselves a little radical triangle like this. This is our x value right here, 28.5 centimeters. Here's our l value. 75 centimeters, and we're trying to find out this angle there. So in our right angle triangle, we've got opposite and adjacent, so we're going to use tangent. Okay, so to find the angle, x, 28.5 centimeters, uh, over, whoa. <laughs> over L, hang on, 75 centimeters, and we end up getting an angle of deviation from the central bright maximum to be 20.8 degrees. So, since that angle of deviation is 20.8 degrees, and that is not less than 10 degrees, then this formula is not valid. So we have to use the other one. So we have to use this, n lambda equals d sine theta. So we're going to calculate the wavelength. OK, but before we do, Notice that we said we're not given D, but we're given the fact that it is ruled, our diffraction grading is ruled with 200 lines per millimeter. So D, remember, is the distance between two lines. So what we need to do is use that information. We'll just do it over here, I suppose. That's the ruling, it is 200 lines per millimeter. So what we do to find out what D is, we take the reciprocal of that. So we go 1 over 200 lines per millimeter. So 1 over 200 um, is, where did I write that down? Oh, right there, 0 0.005. So you get 0 0.005 you take the reciprocal of lines per millimeter, you get millimeters per line. So that's the distance between two lines in millimeters. But we don't want millimeters. We want meters. So we're going to convert that. Just use a conversion factor. One meter for every 1,000 millimeters. And we see that millimeters cancels out. And that gives us our value of D. Uh, it is 5.0.
times 10 to the negative 6 meters. So that is our distance between two slits in our diffraction grating, 5.0 times 10 to the negative 6 meters. So we'll flip back over here. We just calculated D, 5.0 times 10 to the negative 6 meters, sine of 20.8 degrees, divided by N, which is 3, because it's the third bright fringe. So we end up getting the wavelength to be 5.92 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. Which, by the way, is if you convert that to nanometers, remember nano is times 10 to the negative 9, 592 nanometers. So when it says unknown wavelength as light is instant on diffraction grading, and it talks about you can see the light on the screen and stuff like that, that better be in the visible spectrum. And as a matter of fact, it is. So it's sort of a, a check your work kind of a thing. Um, if, you, if it says in the question that, you know, we've got visible light there, it better be in that 400 to 700 nanometer range. Okay. Just to mention this really quick, another phenomenon or evidence of the diffractions of waves would be uh, Poisson's bright spot. So you take a laser, so you've got monochromatic, in this case, red light, and you shine it on a solid disk, and what we would expect if light was just a bunch of particles, we would just expect a shadow on the other side. But what we actually observe is an interference pattern. We've got, imagine this, instead of having your two slits, you've got two edges of the disk. So the laser light diffracts around one edge of the disk, and that means it sort of bends around the corner. And another wave, bends around the bottom corner. So basically, the, the edges of the disc essentially act as the two slits in, in the double slit that I illustrated before. So you're going to have, at a point that is equidistant from one edge of the disc and the other edge of the disc, so basically the middle, you would expect a central bright antinode. As a matter of fact, you do get that. So further evidence of the diffraction of light. Now, diffraction gratings. Now, diffraction grating has a, instead of having two slits, it has a very, very large number of equally spaced parallel lines. So, as a matter of fact, remember we said before that the wavelength of light has to be about the same order of magnitude or small when compared to the size of the slit. The size of the slit has to be small when compared to the wavelength. So if we're talking about a wavelength of light um, that is, you know, of the order of uh, 700 nanometers, we would have to have those lines really, 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 really small. And diffraction gratings have really small lines cut into them. Um, usually around, I think the ones we have in the lab are, is it 300? lines per millimeter, I think, or is it 700? I can't remember, but it's a lot. So hundreds of lines per millimeter means that you've got them really, really close together and they're very, very small. So then light is to be able to diffract. So you've seen, like you've seen this effect here, probably before, uh, when you have a uh, compact disc or nobody use compact disc anymore, but like a DVD, I don't know, this becomes less and less relevant as time goes on, but you see a rainbow effect. And that is actually light diffracting as a result of reflecting off of the surface. So you can be like, well, how can it diffract? What actually happens is, you know, uh, a, a DVD is, has little grooves in it. Um, that's, that's where the information is contained, essentially. So what happens is the light that reflects off the disk comes out of the grooves and the grooves are so small that it causes the light to diffract. And when you shine white light through a diffraction grating or it reflects off a compact disc that essentially acts like a diffraction grating, you get dispersion. 
And that is similar to dispersion that you get through a prism. So, however, it's two diff it's the same effect, but um, for different phenomena. Remember, refraction is the bending of light as it passes from one medium to another. So notice here, if we'll go over the prism one just real quickly, where you've got light shining incident on the surface of the prism, slows down, bends toward the normal, and then as it uh, leaves the prism, speeds up again and bends away from the normal, and the index of refraction varies for each wavelength of light. Red stays the straightest, and violet bends the most. However, for diffraction, it's the opposite. Violet um, refracts the least. I'm sorry, diffracts. Oh my God, diffracts the least in a diffraction grating. Whereas the higher the wavelength of light, in other words, red light, the more it diffracts. So it's the opposite. Okay, one last thing. Polarization. It is another example of the wave nature of light. Now there's a couple of videos that I'm gonna show you or that I've linked to in the Google Classroom here that I want you to watch on polarization, but light, the model that we used, Maxwell's model that you learned about in the first section of chapter 13 there, we modeled that light wave as a transverse wave with crests and troughs, and I keep mentioning crests and troughs. It is not a longitudinal wave like a sound wave with compressions and rarefactions. How do we know? Because you can't see that wave. It is a picture that we've drawn in our, our brains, a model, essentially. So imagine like the, the wave that we easily demonstrate in class for physics 20 is we stretch a spring or a slinky across the front of the class and then we wave our hand up and down and mm -hmm. waves travel down the slinky. So if I move my hand up vertically, then you'd have a vertically polarized wave. It's oscillating up and down. If I move my hand side to side like this, then it's a horizontally polarized wave and I can move it diagonally, diagonally the other way. And that's what we have for a light beam. A light beam is a whole bunch of waves oscillating and it's not the fields remember the electric field is oscillating and the magnetic field is oscillating so let's just talk about the electric field component there the electric field component would be oscillating vertically horizontally depending on the specific wave so imagine this beam of light right here from this light bulb you've got this randomly polarized light where the light waves are vibrating up and down left and right diagonal diagonal and we pass it through what is called a polarizer. Now it's not, it might look like a diffraction grating because it's got a bunch of slits, but the slits are too far apart and too large uh, to cause diffraction. So what happens is like the waves that are going back and forth like this, they would not be able to pass through the, the polarizer. Only the waves that are oscillating up and down would be able to get through uh, the first polarize, polarizing filter. So what you get is, vertically polarized EMR. If you take another Polaroid filter and then you turn it 90 degrees to that and you put it in front of the original diffraction grating, well now only the waves that were vibrating up and down pass through that first one and they would not be able to pass through these slits. And as a matter of fact, what you get, you get two Polaroid filters like this, you get, hold it in front of my face, you get, um, no light passing through, so it turns dark. So it's actually really cool. So you'll see if you get two Polaroid filters where the, the axis of polarization are parallel to each other, you're gonna get, say for example, horizontally polarized waves coming through here. <clears throat> but then when you turn it, this one slowly 90 degrees, the light gets darker and darker and darker, and right there, it gets to be totally dark. No light goes through. So that is absolutely 100% for sure strong evidence of the transverse wave nature of light. Because if light was made up of particles, for example, the particles just shot through the, the holes in your polarizer or your polarizer, no matter which way you turned it, you'd still have light getting through. Um, if light was longitudinal waves, were like sound waves with compressions and rarefactions, the light, the light waves would just move sort of in and out, like the oscillations would be in and out of this uh, polarizer and it wouldn't matter which way you oriented it because the wave could still pass through.
So what that actually looks like is like, here's an example of two pictures taken, uh, one with a Polaroid filter and one without. So here's the one on the right with the Polaroid filter. You see that, you know, there's this sort of the same picture of this lady behind the glass here. And uh, you see a lot of glare off the glass without the Polaroid filter. And with the Polaroid filter, the glare is eliminated because when light bounces off the a window, and then you would see that as a reflection or glare in this case, that light is partially polarized due to the reflection. So what you do is you take your, um, let's say the light waves are horizontally polarized. You take a vertical polarizing filter and the horizontal waves can't get through. In other words, the glare can't get through. Okay, so that's it for diffraction. Um, there are some pages for you to read and some questions for you guys to practice. That's it. See you next time.